It's crazy to think that we are nearly at episode 60 of the Unexplained Horror Stories series. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. We are on episode 58 of the Unexplained Horror Stories series, and we're chugging right along. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share, whether it's an unexplained story with the paranormal or something else, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going. Now, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true unexplained horror stories. Hey swamp folk, before we get into these stories, I need to take just a second to thank today's sponsor. The world in 2021 can feel like an unstable and dangerous place, but we can't live in fear. Taser is giving people the confidence to protect themselves by creating life-saving self-defense technology. Taser's a line of non-lethal self-protection devices are small and lightweight enough to carry with you or in the glove compartment or a purse. Yes, they're powerful enough to incapacitate an attacker. Guns carry unnecessary risk for you and those around you and even pepper spray can harm you as much as an attacker. And it's often ineffective. Taser products are safer and easy to use. They use an electrical charge to immobilize attackers for up to 30 seconds, allowing you time to escape and send emergency dispatch to your GPS location. Now, we hear a lot of scary stories on this channel with stalkers and creepy people. This is something that has saved more than 237,000 lives. Now, Taser devices are available without a permit in most U.S. states. Get the Taser Pulse Plus or Taser Strike Light at taser.com with promo code SWAMPED. Save 15% now at taser.com promo code SWAMPED. Spelled T-A-S-E-R dot com promo code SWAMPED. Restrictions apply. See site for details. A few weeks ago, I ended up with the house to myself. I rent out a room in Tennessee, and my roommate had gone to see her boyfriend for the weekend. The last few years had been rough, far rougher than they should have been. The struggles were never-ending, and over time they filled me with what can only be described as pure rage in my heart. So, with the house to myself and a bottle of whiskey, I decided to use the opportunity of privacy to vent on my frustrations. I yelled them out as loud as I could, eventually set my sights on God and the devil. As far as I was concerned, one should have helped me long ago and not put me in a never-ending cycle of what most people of faith would call testing me or working in mysterious ways. The other? Well, if it was not God testing me or playing with me, then surely the devil had some hand in it. Either way, the anger was pouring out faster and faster leading to me going through my last 11, I am 29 by the way, years on this earth. Every single moment I felt accused of falsehoods or blamed for something that I clearly did not do. Every single time I was used and discarded, abandoned, and made the last choice. The list just goes on and on. I shouted obscenities at them. I called them on what I considered their hypocrisy or missteps. I said whatever I could in some sort of hope that somehow I would get the nigh-impossible response from either. I was screaming everything out with such ferocity that I sobered myself up. I remember vividly standing there realizing this and smiled. Drinking had become a crutch and I realized that I had so much bottled up in me, no pun intended, that I was just trying to numb it. I know, this is not a therapy session, but I promise this is all relevant to my story. I was finally calm pouring the rest of the bottle into the sink, and then finishing my venting session with my final words to the one above and the one below. When it came to he who watches from above, I told him I would never ask him for anything if I lived. I would regain my life by myself, and I would show him what I was worth. As for the one below, well, I told him that when the day came that I died and went to the afterlife, if there is one, I would find out what the cause for the resistance on all fronts in my life, and that if I found out he was a part of it, no matter if I somehow got lucky enough to go to paradise, that I would claw my way down to hell and fight him myself, and that if I ended up in hell, it would just make the goal so much easier for me. I know, it may sound completely asinine, 
But hey, it was the last of the anger I needed to get out. With my final words having been said, I enjoyed the rest of my night. I did laundry, watched a movie, ate, and then got ready for bed, sipping on soda instead of alcohol for once. I fell asleep feeling completely content and determined to start the next day, running, ready to uphold the promises I had made not only to God and Satan but to myself, especially to myself. Here is where the supernatural comes in. I awoke in my bed groggy-eyed and not knowing what time it was. I only knew it was sometime before 6am as not even a sliver of daylight was coming in through my room's curtains. I rolled onto my side and started to push myself up. My vision was blurrier than it had ever been. To be honest, I felt like I had been roofied. I shook my head, rubbed my eyes, even gave myself a light smack or two, but still my vision was blurred. I was still trying to figure out why my vision was so off when suddenly I felt a heaviness in the air. I felt an almost primal feeling that there was danger near me. Vision still blurry, I turned my head and swear that I saw a man standing at the foot of my bed. I could not see any features, only a silhouette and pure darkness filling every inch of him. Fight or flight kicked in and I tried to spring up, ready to confront whoever was in my room. But when it happened, as I tried to stand up, I felt the heaviest pressure I could imagine pushed down on me. I caught myself with my hands ending up on my knees. I tried to straighten up, but the pressure simply intensified, pushing my forehead down into my mattress, making me look like I was kneeling before a ruler, ironically facing the direction where the shadow was. I will be honest, I was starting to feel true panic. I pushed myself back up to where I had been previously, but I still could not stand. I still could not get past the point of kneeling with my head down. I found I could sway side to side, so I began to do so, hoping it would help, and still not understanding why I was unable to stand. Still worried about the inescapable feeling that my eyes had not deceived me and that someone or something was standing at the foot of my bed, I swayed back and forth for what felt like many, many minutes, pushing as hard as I ever had with my arms to avoid my head slamming back into the mattress and trying desperately to get my legs to at least get me off my knees. At this point, the only comparison that I could make to this feeling was a gravity chamber from an anime I have enjoyed since childhood. I felt like the gravity had doubled and my body had no means of outmuscling it. I was stuck there, swaying side to side while using every ounce of energy I had to stay in the position I currently held. It was then that the pressure intensified and I began to smell smoke. I have no candles in my room, no incense, and I don't smoke at all. Nothing could be attributed to the smell. I used all the strength I could to get myself to look up and saw what I believed I had. A figure standing at the end of my bed, smoke emanating from its outline. True fear set in at this moment. I knew this was not sleep paralysis. I had experienced that once as a child and knew that sleep paralysis did not last past the point of being able to move most of your body. I was being forced downward against my will not because I was paralyzed, but because something did not want me to stand up. Something wanted me kneeling. With fear came fight or flight. I could not stand or straighten, but I could still barely sway. My vision was still rather blurry, but I had a good sense of where I was in my room and swayed to my right, towards the head of my bed where the pillow still laid, my knife resting underneath one of them. I slid my hand under the pillow and found it. All the while using my left arm to hold myself up against the unrelenting pressure, I simply never stopped. The burning in my arm was worse than any lactic acid buildup I had ever experienced as someone who loves going to the gym. Still, this was it. This was the only option I felt I had, and I took my shot. I gripped the knife with the reverse grip to use it in a slashing motion, and I swung my body towards the foot of the bed, slashing out towards the figure. I screamed as I did this since the pressure was almost unbearable at this point. It had honestly felt like an hour of fighting against an unseen force pushing on me with more weight than I have ever felt in my life. As soon as the blade seemed to make contact, the figure vanished and I flew forward and hit my head on the small dresser by the foot of my bed. Ignoring the pain, I shot up, the weight having suddenly vanished. I turned on the light and saw no one around anywhere. The door to my room was still locked tight from the inside. My windows were still latched shut. I flung open my closet to find no one hiding in it. 
I then shot into the rest of the house, even breaking one of my own personal rules by checking my roommate's room because there had to be someone in the house. But there was no one. Nothing. Everything was completely still and eerily normal. As soon as I finished searching the house, nausea struck me. I ran to the bathroom and vomited pure black. For five minutes, I threw up non-stop. Non-stop pure black vomit. I had no words then, and I have no words now. I cannot offer an actual explanation for any of this, but I do have two theories, and I would like to close out with them. My first theory is the one that would have much better titles for a supernatural story if it happened to be true. I threatened the devil himself, and then that very night, I awake to a pressure that I still get chills thinking about. A figure emanating smoke at the end of my bed, along with that pressure forcing me into a posture of what can only be described as servitude. Could it really be a coincidence that all of this happened mere hours after I threatened the devil? I'm not saying the devil himself was standing at the foot of my bed. This is not a TV show. I am not a Winchester or anything. I could never presume to be worth the devil's personal time. But maybe it was a demon. Maybe a foot soldier sent out to instill some fear. Teach me to know my place, maybe. Who knows? But that's theory number one. Number two is the one I believe in more, although it's just pretty much like the first theory. I cannot honestly say with 100% confidence that this is what happened. However, it is the only other thing I can think of. I believe in people's energy, both positive and negative. I think this energy can have a lot to do with how we live our lives, but the interactions we may have with the other side might also be affected by our energy. I spent an hour of that day screaming out every ounce of anger and hatred that was in me. All the resentment, contempt, sadness, and pain. I screamed it all out, like I was releasing the floodgates. And that very morning this figure appears, this pressure pushing down on me so heavily, just like a feeling of years of struggle weighing on your shoulders. Maybe that figure at the foot of the bed was the culmination of all the hatred. Maybe it was everything I had screamed out earlier and it wanted back in. I do not really know, honestly. All I do know is that this was one of the scariest moments of my life that I just can't explain. This was far scarier than any fight I've ever been in, any car crash in a vehicle, any near-death experience. The feeling of that unseen weight, the smoke emanating from the shape, and that black substance that shot out of me when it was over is something I will never forget. Thank you for reading this and hopefully sharing it. I'm hoping maybe one of your followers may have experienced something similar. Maybe someday, I will find out what really happened. The story took place when I was a kid. My dad has been a pool man for many years. One of his oldest customers decided to purchase a ranch. I don't exactly remember where. He asked my dad if he could come and fix their pool, which was disastrously maintained before he bought it. He gave my dad permission to bring us along and told us we were welcome to stay a few days to enjoy the ranch. We drove there, and I had been in charge of reading the map quest instructions because I never seemed to be able to sleep during car trips. We drove back home a few days later after my dad was finally able to save the pool. The drive home was very long. For long stretches, the view was mostly desert, farms, and the occasional small suburban town. Unlike me, my mom and brothers knocked out almost immediately. So, most of the trip was just my dad and I talking, or listening to music. I'm also a very avid reader, so I had a book on my lap beside the maps. I remember the ride had been quiet for a while because I had been reading. I had to stop because it was getting dark, and my dad only let me turn on the dome lights to read the maps. No radio service, and the Game Boy's batteries had all died. All I had left to do was look outside. All of a sudden, I spotted a very tall shadow on a roof. I realized there was a man who seemed to be wearing a hat, 
bowler or top hat dancing and jumping from roof to roof of this suburban lot. Kind of like the scene in Singing in the Rain, which at that point I had not seen. It took a second to realize that it was not a normal thing to see. The houses were separated in a way where a normal person could not have jumped roof to roof. What scared me the most is how, at the last house, before a field, he seemed to turn around and sense me. He bowed and tipped his hat. Even though I couldn't see it, I could sense that it was smiling. All I felt was dread. I turned to face my dad to see if he saw him, but he had been paying attention to the road. When I turned back, I couldn't see the houses anymore. They were way behind us. I never saw a face or any details. He was just a silhouette on the roofs. I remember feeling afraid that it would follow us and that it could if it wanted to. I never saw something like that on our many road trips ever again. Sometimes, I wonder if I just imagined it, but it felt so real. The memory is so vivid as well, which always comes back when I'm watching old musicals, because the dancing reminds me of the way that he moved. Hello, Swamp Dweller. A while back, I discovered your channel, and I have been hooked ever since. It has been a great way of making the day go by. I hear these stories on the compilations, and it has changed my perspective on my own encounter. I was embarrassed at the time, but now I feel confident to get this off my chest. This happened just a few years back, not long after my phone blew up with messages telling me that an old friend of mine, Cleo, had died in a car crash. I will be honest about it. I had not hung with Cleo since right after high school, and thinking about it, I wondered if I was ever even really a friend. I did not know what to feel, and it put me in a bad place for a couple of days, sitting around my apartment with this metallic taste lingering in my mouth. Like when you are a kid and lose a tooth and you cannot do anything except taste the blood until it heals. That kind of mindset is not healthy. I pushed it aside and got back to my friend, Chris, who was putting together a little memorial for Cleo on the following Saturday. Just the old gang, he said. Sure, I replied. It would be great to see them again. It is funny. You can say something on Facebook and feel completely different in real life. I guess it does not take a genius to notice that, but it was how I was feeling. I spent the whole six hour drive going over my life in that town, or what had been. I had left so fast, the memories felt like grey mush in my skull, and the only thing left was this itchy feeling that I was right to do so. I kept wondering what they would think of me. We were not old, just approaching our thirties, but from the little I paid attention to on Facebook, they seemed to be on their way to better and brighter things. Chris, for example, was already running the old slaughterhouse on the edge of town, and he already had a wife and a daughter and a house too, all by twenty-four. Passing the city limits, sunset, and tired, made things worse. A ton of bricks weighed down on my shoulders and neck, tightening my head and making me sweat hard, even though it was early December, and I was driving with the windows down. I felt like a candle that someone had thrown water on. Old times flooding back, I guess. I did not want to meet up with them right away. I had decided that way back before crossing the Missouri state line. So I checked in to the new Motel 6 on Connor Street, the way to the hills and into the forest. It looked bigger from there, yet I knew from growing up there, there were no strangers in that town. A tight-knit community where most of the people were friends and all the families knew one another. Nothing had changed, nothing ever changed. I closed the curtains and went to bed. I woke up with a sudden jolt, my hand grabbing my other arm out of reflex. It felt like someone had stuck me with hot pokers. I squirmed on the bed for quite some time, praying for help that never came. I flicked the bedside lamp on to see what had happened. My stomach dropped, twisted. All I was seeing was skin, perfectly normal skin, no burns or scratches or bruises. And to make things even stranger, 
The TV was on volume at full blast out of nowhere. I never even turned it on. I turned off the TV and I turned off the lamp and breathed. The room felt strange, sideways, like someone had broken in and could not find what they were looking for, leaving everything upturned. But nothing had been upturned at all, except for the TV. It was oddly calm. Even the air felt thick and stagnant. I managed to squeeze in a couple of hours of sleep, somehow. When I woke up, it was the same. Only now, sitting at the foot of the bed, I felt heavier, a little sicker than I was just a few hours before. I got in the shower, made sure the water was steaming hot, soothing for maybe 30 seconds, then the anxiety kicked back in, and I nearly made up my mind to just get in the car and ditch that buggy town, go home where I could shut my windows and know for sure nobody was watching me. That is how I felt right then, like I was being watched, kind of like a movie. The whole time I was showering, I had made peace with the fact that some ugly brute with a butcher knife was on the other side of the curtain, licking his lips, waiting for me to let my guard down. Yet, no matter how many times I swung open the curtain, ready to strike, there was nothing. Not even a spider. I felt like I was going crazy. I felt like the best medicine for me was to go see some old friends. Maybe go and get drunk with them as we did junior year, and get this day over with. The funeral was nice and pleasant, not too overdone. A lot of people showed up. I knew some of the faces from growing up. Afterward, as we all shuffled out into the cold rain, I found Chris. We approached each other and nodded at each other and talked, catching up. He said most of the guys left a little early and went to Nate's and to get everything set up for the grill. They were also going to get a bonfire going. I told them that I would follow him there. Then, oh crap. I must have left my wallet. I need to run back to the hotel and get it. I was lying right then. That uneasy feeling still bubbling up in my stomach. I needed some fresh air and drove all around town, seeing my parents' house and my old school and where the old fire station used to be and where the new one is now. It was all so sad and tired looking. And me driving was just another way to avoid the inevitable. Somewhere on 5th Street... I lit out a deep sigh and swung back around towards the direction of Nate's place. The land was as beautiful as it was in high school. Now, Nate owned it, a graduation gift from his uncle. Eight acres of grass and cows and a whole bunch of trees surrounding it, giving off a vibe like a fortress. Sure enough, all the guys were there. I would be lying if I said I did not have a good time. The steak was good, and the beer flowed like we were 17. I loosened up quickly. Each one of us had told a story about Cleo, and that night was spent telling them around the bonfire. When Chris was done with this, the fire had now died down to just a couple of hot coals. He said he had something for us and went over to his truck. He came back with a big plastic tub and told us what was in there. It was everything Cleo had owned. Cleo's mom, Chris said, had brought it over the other day after she had died. She said she could not bear to look at it that it was best just to give it to her friends. That made her death real to all of us. We were silent for a few moments. Then Chris spoke up, and we all agreed that Cleo's mom was right. Each of us picked through the box and found a couple of weird things that we wanted, I guess. I took an alarm clock and this cool weather radio. What was left were just a few small things that we felt weird about taking. How about we just toss it? Chris suggested his eyes on what was left on the bonfire. So we did, and we watched it melt. I was sobering up by then. We all were. We said our goodbyes and went off. I got back to my room a little after two in the morning, threw my things down, and fell asleep. I snapped awake to the sound of an alarm clock going off. My heart was racing. I was heaving. My arms burned once again. That clock. I knew there were not any batteries in that darn thing. I checked when I got it. But there it was, going off like crazy. I slapped it a few times before ear-piercing static nearly sent me into cardiac arrest. The weather radio had turned itself on, and now the volume was getting louder and louder, ignoring my finger slamming on the off button. Suddenly, it went silent, maybe to let the clock have a turn at screaming. Slowly, however, the volume rose and the static intensified. I dug my finger into the off button, and this time it listened but not for very long. Then the TV popped on. Once more, 
There was static and strangely it sounded the same as the weather radio. Only this time, there was a light humming from underneath it, pulsating until I could hear it over the static. It was a voice, and it was talking, begging me to set it free. Then I heard something I will never forget. Cleo. The voice said over and over. It was Cleo. She wanted to be set free. I cannot put into words the fear that was going through me. This was not Cleo. I remember my grandmother telling me and my sisters about demons lying to you to get what they want. Once they know who you are, they play any kind of emotion to win. I got up, ripped the TV cord out, and gathered my radio and clock and went into the bathroom. I filled the tub halfway, then I threw them in. As they sunk to the bottom of the tub, I could hear static drowning, angry, popping, and sparking until it died. Smoke even rose from the water. I grabbed my belongings and checked out and drove back home in the dark through a nasty snowstorm. It was worth it. As soon as I left Missouri, the weight of my shoulders lifted, and I forgot about the past two days. It was only after months of blankness that the events flooded back into my mind. I concluded that ghosts and demons or whatever evil is out there will always be lurking in the shadows, will always be waiting for a soul to be afraid. I made a deal with myself to never mess with that side of the world. It will always lead to hell and suffering. I try to do good stuff now. I go to church just about every week. I need something to protect me. Maybe there is a heaven or maybe it's all in my head, but I would like to be prepared for whatever happens. Thank you Swamp Dweller for allowing me to share my story. I hope my experience gives comfort to those who encounter the paranormal worse than me because anyone can survive evil if their heart is in the right place. When I was 13 years old, my family moved into a home in a nice neighborhood in Tucson, Arizona. It was a relatively new build, somewhere around 2002, and was part of a very nice subdivision. I lived in the house from ages 13 to 19. There was a year in the college dorms in the middle. No one had died in that house that I could find, and overall, it didn't have any of those haunted house red flags. Also, for context, although I am currently not very religious, I grew up in an extremely Christian and religious family. The entire time I lived in the house, I had horrible nightmares, to the point where I was scared to go to sleep. My parents would sort of play it off like there was nothing wrong at all. My parents were on one side of the house and had their own bathroom. On my side of the house, it was just me, and no one used my bathroom outside of myself. At night, I would hear the sink turn itself on and the toilet flush. No one was ever in the bathroom when I looked. I tried to play it off as nothing, maybe just faulty plumbing. I would also hear scratching in the attic relatively frequently. My childhood home had a stray cat that often got into our attic, so I quickly explained that away as likely some sort of animal, even though this was a newer house with a sealed attic and we never found any animals up there. I thought all of this was just happening to me. Eventually, my mom and dad started talking about the footsteps they heard at night, though. My mom said they would walk around the house, but she didn't see or feel any negative energy, so she thought that it was maybe an angel or a deceased loved one protecting us, insert eye roll at the angel comment here. My dad said the footsteps happened every single night. I stayed awake one night and, sure as hell, it sounded like someone shuffling through the house. All of this seemed like pretty harmless activity, until one night in my late teens, I woke up to find my bedroom door closed. I had a mirror on the back of my bedroom door, and I was always afraid of seeing something in the mirror, so I kept the door open and the hall light on. Everyone in the house knew about my obsession with keeping the door open later. When I asked about it, no one in my family said they shut my door. Upon seeing the door shut, I immediately panicked. I got out of bed, heart pounding, and tried to not look in the mirror. I opened the door, took a deep breath, and walked back to my bed. I remember thinking something along the lines of, this is the part of the horror movie where I get attacked, and then I laid down in my bed. The next part, I'm not even kidding, I know people will call BS on this and say it didn't happen, but I know without a shadow of a doubt this happened to me, and I can't explain it to save my life. The second I laid down in bed, it was like the covers pulled over my face and someone was holding them down over my head. It felt like hands were all over my body pinning me down. I felt like I was burning all over, 
and I could hear the sound of what seemed to be firewood burning in my ears. I could also hear laughing. I couldn't move at all, and I felt like I was going to die. Regardless of your views on religion, all I could think to do was pray. I don't know if I prayed out loud or really just prayed in my head, but I said something like, In the name of Jesus, stop! Three times. I remember very specifically on the third time, everything seemingly evaporated. My house was quiet, and I ran. I bolted into my parents' room, covered in a sweat and sobbing. My dad said it was a nightmare. I got angry and yelled at him for not listening to me. I would not go back into my room at all. My mom took it a little bit more seriously. The next day, she had the house anointed and prayed over, and everything seemingly stopped after that. The footsteps, the nightmares, the toilet flushing, everything. We eventually moved out of the house, and nothing like that ever happened again. But it seems like everywhere I go since then, weird stuff still happens to me periodically, but not to that scale. Like I said, I'm not super religious anymore, but this is one of those things I can't really explain. I know it happened. My family knows it happened. I can't offer any logical explanation for what went down that night. Hey, thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true unexplained horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it in its algorithm, and that's very helpful to me. If you're listening to this on iTunes or another podcast platform, please be sure to give this a 5 star rating, as it truly helps me out a ton over there. If you guys enjoyed my friend As the Raven Dreams who read story number 2 today, please be sure to check out their channel. You can find the link to do so in the description down below. They also read scary stories over on their channel. If you guys have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's an unexplained story or something entirely different, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. I would love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. I'd honestly have to say story number one is my favorite tonight. That's just some crazy stuff, and I don't even know what I would do if I experienced that myself. If you guys are on the go and don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories wherever you go, you can download them absolutely free from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. And it's absolutely free and always will be. If you would like to support The Swamp outside of hitting that like button, giving us a 5 star rating on iTunes, and perhaps subscribing, maybe check out our merch store. We have t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, and more. I'd love to see you guys rocking some cool Swamp threads. Be sure to check me out at Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and other social medias, and I'll see you soon with another creepy video.